It was just the most massive thing I've ever seen. I, to tell you the honest truth, I thought, well, we're the only ones left on this planet. Something's happened. We've missed something here. The fear that went in me when I seen it was just, um, like the feeling, I'd say it was fear, but I've never felt that feeling before in my entire life. It's a weird feeling, like you can't explain it when you don't know. You feel like you're being followed, but you don't know what it is. We had two to our right, another one in front of us, another one to the left, and another one just across the road, shaking the daylight out of the tree. All we get was a big red eye. I remember waking up and looking at the end of the bed and there was a figure there, almost insect-like, and then I blacked out. Welcome to the show, everyone. My name is Cade Moyer, and you are listening to the Believe Paranormal and UFO podcast. If you have had an encounter and would like to share it, please get in touch with me. My email address is believepod at gmail.com. If you enjoy the podcast, be sure to leave us a rating or review wherever you listen and head on over to our website, believepod.com, and consider becoming a member to get bonus episodes and video content. Tonight, I'm joined by Martin, and Martin is a retired minister. So, Martin, welcome to the show. Hi, thanks, Katie. Thanks for having me. It's really cool to have you on, Martin. Uh, Your email hooked me instantly because it's not very often we get a minister emailing the show who has had so many encounters with uh, the unknown because I'm, I'm going to do a little bit of a, a book note uh, version of today's episode where uh, you used to be a MUFON field investigator. You've done paranormal and, ha- uh, and haunting investigations. You've had encounters with the paranormal when you're quite a, a, a young child. So yeah, mate, you are, you are an absolute mixed bag and I kind of love it. So, <laughs> mate, <laughs> let's, let's go back to the start and, uh, tell me about this shadow figure that you saw when you were quite a young fellow. Yeah. So it's, it's a little bit different than many of the shadow figures that you hear about now. And, and, you know, it's interesting with the shadow figure phenomena as such, because it, it really only started popping up about 15, 15 years ago or so. I started seeing the odd reference and now everybody in the gods is shadow figures. So I'm not quite, quite sure if that's a reporting issue or if that's an increase in actual activity. But the, the one that occurred for me would have been around, I'm, I was trying to figure out what year it would have been. So I was, between the ages of seven and nine, I think. And if you can imagine, have all your listeners close your eyes and picture the scene. So at the time, my uh, a brother and I, we shared a double bed, and he was three years older than myself. And laying in bed, to, to look down at the foot of the bed, there's a, a, just past it, there's a dresser and a mirror. And in the mirror, you can see reflected out through the window um, a street light and the, 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 the shadows caused by branches and the like. So you can see the room, right? And you can see the branches swaying and the shadows in the room. Um, and I just woke up and I looked down at my feet. And, and what I'll ask you to imagine is a black, like a cardboard cutout. It was flat, it was solid. It's not like a shadow against the wall that would sort of bend and twist with the seams and the thing. This this thing rose from the foot of the bed slowly, head and shoulders and torso. And it slowly rose and it blocked out the dresser and it blocked out the mirror and it absorbed all the light. There was nothing reflect, this was flat black. And as a silhouette, I'll ask you to imagine if you're holding a camera with two hands up to your face and you know your elbows are out to the side, that's the shape of it. So it rose with its arms, using air quotes here, it rose with its arms up to its torso, up to its waist, and just faced the bed. And I just stared at it and I can still very much, I I still have a very visceral feeling when I I recount this. And it, it hung there. And slowly it just went back down below the edge of the bed. And I remember my eyes watering and I couldn't speak. Like I was just choked with fear. You know, you had the fight, flight or freeze. I froze. And after it, it, it went below the edge of the bed again, I, I was on my back and my brother was on his right side. So I shimmied over until my right shoulder hit his back. 
and uh, I think by exhaustion, I finally fell asleep just just by being exhausted, um, and th and that was it. And some years ago, um, some twenty odd years later, thirty odd years later, I was uh, I knew a hypnotherapist in uh, Vancouver, British Columbia, and we recounted this, and it didn't add any more detail. So my recollection of it was has remained vivid and, and clear for all those years. That would have been terrifying at six years old to to see something like that. It's kind of like the the story of the boogeyman has come to life and is essentially rising from underneath your bed. Yeah, and I wonder if there's a photograph out there. Because, <laughs> like I said, I have that shape, right? And I said, is there a photograph out there of some kid? You know, with with this shocked look on his face, you know, hanging on some shadow person's you know bathroom wall or something. I don't know, but it's yeah, and and it's it's one of those things. I'm, I've got a background in psychology, and I'm and I'm a counseling therapist, um, and I, I do a lot of reading on on on, on uh, memory and and brain damage and and uh, these sorts of things. Um, anybody wants a, a good book on the nature of how the brain functions or dysfunctions, it's called du Dueling Neuroscientists. And it talks about uh, the history of basically what we know about the brain and, and how we got here. So that sort of thing has always fascinated me. And, um, and, and memory is a dubious, very dubious, fluid thing. But that memory has not altered one bit over the years. I haven't embellished it. It hasn't faded in terms of its impact. It's still a very powerful image. Yeah, it's it's rather interesting because I, I always say to guests who come on to the show when they have encounters of something so terrifying at such a young age that it kind of just imprints itself on their memory and the, the way that they can constantly, uh, I guess, retell the, the story without missing a beat. I don't know if that kind of adds more credence to their encounter or not. It, it really just... For me, it kind of shows that this is a essentially a paradigm breaking event, and that yeah. leaves its mark on on the mind. Sure, very much so. Yeah. So yeah. when when you saw this thing, you you say it was kind of this this black mass, and it was almost like light couldn't escape it. Is that you're kind of saying it was blacker than black? You could see this even though it was dark. Um. Yeah. So. I, I, the, the room was lit to some degree with the street light just up the road. So when you open your eyes, you can, you know, I could see everything in the room. It wasn't bright, bright. You couldn't read a book by the light, but you could see everything. So when this thing rose, like I said, it was like a cardboard. If you took a cardboard cutout in the shape I described and, and spray painted it flat black, that's what it would have looked like. It reflected no light coming in through the window at all. Yeah, and, and, and where is that had that, and this is why I say I kind of make the distinction, and, and I'm sure others have seen this too, but I haven't read too many accounts of it, where it had that solid shape. Many of the shapes, shadow figures, you know, if it goes around the corner, it bends, you know, it, it looks like an actual shadow. But this, this, had, this had substance to it. Yeah, because I hear a lot of like Shadow Man stories or, or Hat Man stories, and it, and it almost seems like there's a, a sense of fuzziness uh, to it. But this is this almost seems like this is just like such a solid tangible thing that was in your room and and that's why i can't help but wonder if it if it doesn't actually fit the shadow man category like if there's you know if there's another subset or something or if it's something completely different but it gets sort of lumped into the shadow man category simply because of some of the the commonalities but it it it, it was very different i think yeah it, it definitely sounds rather rather unique in that that whole sense there and what i find really fascinating is the fact that you got hypnotherapy did you get the hypnotherapy because you wanted to remember more about this specific encounter or was that just a something that you kind of just threw in while you're getting hypnotherapy done that well you know it was an add-on the um i had uh, i've always been i'm actually now a certified hypnotherapist so um, I've always had an interest in, in uh, hypnosis and um, and memory, false memory, and these sorts of things. So um, some years ago, for fun, I was sitting around when I was in British Columbia, and I and I saw an advertisement from a psychologist who did regression hypnosis. So I said, "Oh, I'll go get regression, uh, get some regression hypnosis." And 
you know, I was I was a Scotsman laying on my laying on my straw bed with a fire going in my clan by me, and I was dying from a from a sword wound. I'm like, God, where did that come from? Sort of deal. So it was after that that I had met um, met this other hypnotherapist, and there was a there was a couple things that I was curious about. I couldn't quite put a finger on, so I went in for something completely different. And it, it may or may not have involved uh, aliens. I'm not quite sure. I'm not at the point of quite, um, it doesn't feel like a memory. It feels like something else. So, but that's what I went in for. And I'm, I'm not sure if I want to get into that because I'm still sort of processing it. But the, um, but at, at the end of it, I said, oh, by the way, would you mind if we visit a, a definite memory? And she said, sure. And, and this memory around the, uh, around the shadow was the one that we revisited. Like I said, there was, there was no new uh, information and it didn't alter my, my recollection or perception of it at all. Did it give you a different perspective of that encounter being a little bit older and having a little bit more, I guess, uh, real life experience to you? Oddly, it's, that's an interesting question. Um, oddly, no. Um, my recollection of it, the emotional um, experience of it, the un- un- uncertainty and the questions surrounding it, they didn't feel any different all those years later. I have to say it it was one of those profound instances that I think despite my young age at the time, like you say, it sort of solidified in my in my psyche. you know it just sort of became this 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 pivotal moment. I, I wish I could be more specific about the year, but I can't. But in terms of its, the experience itself, it, it did not shift over the years, which to me lends credence to to the to the physicality of what actually happened. Yeah, absolutely. And that's kind of why I was going down that that line of questioning there is because just uh, world views change as you, you know, as you mature, as you kind of go through life and you experience different things. And, um, you know, I guess your your journey to become a minister you, you probably encountered quite a few, I guess, uh, things that may challenge your your idea of faith or, or things like that. And uh, I guess seeing a, an entity or something like this in your room would be one of those kind of standout moments that make you go, hmm, what was that? Yeah. It, well, you know, with regards to the faith issue, it's I, I know in some, <laughs> I can imagine some of your uh, audience hearing the word clergy our minister tonight going uh, right um the the thing about the denomination to which i belong it is very justice oriented it is very inclusive it is not about you know proselytizing it is not about going and saving the unwashed masses i mean it's none of those unfortunately you know sort of negative and pejorative sort of connotations and images that that Often the word minister will ascribe. I mean, for, some, for many people, it's a very positive thing, but increasingly, uh, it's it's somewhat negative or somewhat dubious. Um, but the uh, to, to your point, um, I've always considered myself to be just a wildly open, curious person. I mean, curiosity is in in therapy, you know, with clients. You know, curiosity is one of the things that that I try and, and encourage people to do to. Just sort of be open to the experience and open to other people's stories, to not prejudge, to not predetermine, you know, to not, you know, counter argue things. I, I think we can talk for maybe 15, 30 seconds, and the person listening to us is already formulating a response. So just in terms of the way we communicate, people often don't get to finish their story without the, the listener sort of shutting down and starting to formulate how they're gonna react to that. And they haven't heard the whole story yet. So um, I, I, I've always tried to practice and encourage just sort of sit back, be open, let the story unfold, not prejudge, and to hear what people have to say. Uh, it's funny because I take the the same approach to, to this podcast because you hear a lot of interviews and I guess the, the interviewer kind of jumps in far too early before I guess the, the experience here really gets to, to share their story and that's... One thing that I've learned is basically you just bite your tongue and you bite your tongue just that little bit longer. <laughs> exactly, yeah. And, and and before we started, of course, you and I were chatting and I said, that's one of the reasons why I continue to listen to your podcast and for other podcasts, I've tried them and I've just 
just nope, this isn't working for me. Um, but but yours is one of the ones that I've hung on with. Well, mate, I appreciate you uh, hanging around, and, and it's always great to to chat to a listener. But mate, I I have to ask, how did you become a MUFON field investigator? Because you you have a lot of interesting elements going on in your life, and I feel like this would have been I don't know, is this something out of left field to to kind of just add into? The, the everyday life of a minister? No, it's, um, you know, it's kind of a chicken and an egg. When did the, my interest in the in the unusual begin? Um, my favorite aunt, who just recently passed away at the age of 89, I think, she she was born on Halloween, you know, and when we would visit my uh, mother's grandparents, my aunt was always there, she would tell us ghost stories, you know, and so she was always very engaging. So I don't know if she started it or if she just sort of, uh, reaffirmed uh, my my interest uh, in um, in the unusual. Uh, interestingly enough, the, the business of becoming about a, a move on field investigator, it was you know many people have this, this kind of interest, uh, and they may be for you guys. You know, it might be the Yowie, it might be UAPs, it may be abductions, it could be fairies, it could be whatever the case may be. And sometimes we we have the particular particular slant, but. As I said, you know, listening and being curious, I got into a variety of things. And as a child, I've got my favorite books on my bookshelf here. Um, I've always been interested in UFOs. You know, I was, there was an old UFO magazine that would have, interestingly enough, when you look back at it, and I remember one cover in particular, you know, Elvis being in a stasis tube was on the cover of this magazine. <laughs> <laughs> and I look at that edition now and it's so funny. Um, I feel bad for the family because I thought, guys, that's pretty disrespectful. But then inside, and I can't remember the account, but there were actual now um, sort of um, the the, the um, benchmark, you know, foundational UFO story. So it was a mix of farcical and fact. Um, and even as a child, I would look at that and go, mm, you know, you could pick out the the BS from the from the more um, from the more substantial sort of uh, cases. So I've always been interested in it. There's never been a time where I haven't. One of the, in a in a similar vein to the to the shadow figure, uh, at around the age of ten or eleven, my parents and I were driving uh, across the province in which I was born, and um, we stopped because we saw three daylight discs. Uh, imagine a juggler juggling three balls. Well, this is what three daylight discs were doing. Oh wow! And for my and for my father to stop, right? And we stopped, and the three of us got out of the car, and we watched this. We watched it. It, it had to be. We had to watch this for about five minutes, and then finally, like boop, 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 one, two, three, they all shot up. So that really helped to sell it. I, I, you know, I never had any doubt around the the possibility uh, of UFOs and, and visitation. Um, but you know to see something like that in the middle of the day and the sun glinting off uh discs and stuff i mean it was pretty remarkable i have to say i always like shared encounters like that because it really solidifies what you're seeing and it's always fun to to talk to the multiple people who have had the that encounter because the the thing that i love about ufo experiences is that how intimate they are regardless of how many people you have that with because it, it affects different people in different ways and i guess with with you uh being a psychologist you would completely understand what i'm saying there in the sense that uh these paradigm breaking events affect people in in the most unusual ways moving forward yeah, and you know when I when I think back to that encounter, it it does it does remind me of many other situations where people see something, and then they carry on and they don't talk about it. I do not recall my parents and I back in the car and on the drive. We had another hour and a half drive to where we were going. I do not recall us talking about it. And my father had died forty years ago. But it, since then, I've asked my mother on a couple of occasions, do you remember that day? And she does not remember that day. And I don't know why she doesn't remember that day, but I remember it quite vividly. It's a funny thing because I don't know if it's uh, it's 
the universe telling you how great it is and it could affect some people in the in the way that they kind of feel a little bit small in the world when they see something like sure. that yeah yeah i i I, th- I think you have a tendency you know, consciously or otherwise to sort of reevaluate you know the meaning of life and your existence and your place in the world uh when you've got something like that occurring in front of you and it's what does that mean you know um and does everything that i hold near and dear you know really matter that much or does it matter more you know and it's uh yeah it, it i think for some people it, it can be uh, quite quite upsetting actually in terms of you know how they how they realign their their view of the world and their significance to who they are so anyway that that goes back to to the uh field investigator stuff so um when i uh, landed uh in uh in bc on canada's west coast um I just decided, you know, I, I heard about MUFON and I, I found out how to contact them and uh, and I joined and I've, I've still got my field investigator's manual around here somewhere. Uh, and I, I connected with, and in the back of the MUFON journal, I don't know if they still do it now, if they even still have the journal now, but they used to have new members. And they used to say what town you were from, what city you were from. And there was a number of other people from the lower mainland BC. So this is before internet, computers even. So I tracked them down the old-fashioned way with a phone book. I just started calling people by that name and that initial and, and, and found several of them. And, and so a bunch of us in Vancouver started hanging out and being involved. Um, and this is where, with a couple of the guys, they were, their slant was more towards uh, abductees. So I started um, working with a couple of abductees. But just as an aside to that, we discovered... 15, 20 years after the fact, after I left, this would have been, um, I, I left around 2000. Um, quite a few years after that, we found out that one of the guys that we were hanging around with, he was an acquaintance of mine, I can't even remember his name now. He finally confessed to some friends of ours that he had been recruited by Bigelow and he had gone, Bigelow had sent him from NIDS, from, uh, from Skinmarker Ranch fame, had sent him uh, to England on a couple of occasions to investigate crop circles. And apparently he was also one of the people that witnessed witnessed a, a black entity emerge from a portal on Skidwalker Ranch. What? And he never, yeah, he never told any of us. Never said a thing. What a bastard. So, <laughs> I, know. <laughs> I know. If he'd been a friend of mine, I would have tracked him down. But like I said, he was an acquaintance of mine, but friends that knew him, Said, yeah, he finally later confessed once his uh, once his connection, and not only only once the connection with Bigelow was completed, but um, it was years after that that finally he said, yeah, by, oh by the way, and everybody was like, what, right? So it it it, it kind of it's kind of like people now discovering um, at Skidmarker Ranch if you're watching the the series that um, oh god, I'm I'm terrible with names, Kate. Um, the um, um, one of the lead scientists, the astronomer, the, the literal rocket science sets uh, from the south there, he um, uh, he's on the team there in the, in the show for people to watch. They know who I'm talking about because I can't remember his name. But he was one of the people involved with writing one of the reports uh, for Congress. Oh, Travis, uh, Travis Taylor. Travis, yeah, tra- Travis Taylor. Yeah, yeah. So, so apparently now some of, some of the reports coming out from the crew from Skidmarker Ranch show are like, yes, that... You, Travis, like, you never told us this, but he had to keep it quiet, of course. Right? It's rather so, interesting, isn't it? Because this is a guy who's essentially working on a reality TV show. Like, that's essentially it, what the Skinwalker Ranch TV show is. And, and sure. don't get me wrong, I absolutely love it. Um, I'm, mm-hmm. I'm kind of pissed over here in Australia. It, it seems to be about a year or two behind where everyone else is in the world with it. Um, right. But yeah, I was I was absolutely astonished when I learned that Travis Taylor was working on the, yeah. uh, the reports for Congress. It blew my mind. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, with his credentials, you can understand why he is. <clears throat> but at the same time, it's it, it's kind of as soon as I heard that, it reminded me of of this story about this fellow I knew back back in the day. It's like you're sitting amongst us, you're talking with us, you're gathering information, you know, and suddenly your, your paranoid little button kicks, you know, gets activated. It's like, man, were you just fine on us? Like, what's going on here? So, uh, but uh, but I I get that. I mean, it's it, it's you know, it's a 
you're do. I mean, his life doesn't consist of Skinwalker Ranch. He has a life well outside of it. They pull him in for good reason. So, of course, he's going to be doing other things. And of course, if you're writing reports for Congress, you're not going to be sitting around the table having a beer and shooting your mouth off about it until well after the fact. You know, so it's understandable. But yeah, I, I can imagine for that it is. With my own experience, it's a bit frustrating that, you know, you didn't tell us, you couldn't go by in it. So. And I guess the, the frustrating thing is, is that uh, it's not just the fact that you, you kind of missed out on fantastic storytelling by that individual, but the the experience that you could have potentially landed off that would have been... I know. Would have been yeah. huge. Yeah. Well, a friend of mine that told me this story just the other day, shout out to Johnson, um, he actually was initially approached... There's this guy down in the States and he's doing this stuff on a ranch and he'd like for you to go down. I mean, it was pretty, you know, pretty, pretty vague to say the least. And he was like, man, I'm in university. I don't have time for this. I don't even know what you're talking about. So now, of course, of course all these years later, it's like, man, I could have been on Skinwalker Ranch. I could have been in England, you know, in Avesbury, he's checking out these crop circles. So it's funny how sometimes life just, uh, you know, you, you miss those uh, great opportunities. But of course, he didn't know. He didn't. He wasn't presented with the, the fullness of the facts. And, and and of course, now we think of Skinwalker Ranch. And um, yeah, of course, who would say no to that now? But at the time, it wasn't even known. You know, it, and it, it's grown into something more. So, you know, in fairness to him, you know, he wasn't given all the information and it, and it didn't have the significance that it does now. But he was also one of the ones that got me into some of the abductee stuff. And and what he and a friend of his did, um, he we used to be able to say he hooked me up, but that has different connotation these days. Uh, he um, he got me in contact, or he had a couple of adductees contact me, who were part of very fundamental Christian churches, had these abductee experiences. Their their individual churches wanted to exercise them because, of course, it must be demonic. Uh, they didn't think it was, and they wanted to toss to somebody who was walking both sides of the fence, you know, both science and, and, and religion. And so I met with each of them separately and basically had a kind of a counseling session on how they might be able to, to navigate this and to, to, you know, help them, um, help them accept the possibility of the reality of this, but put it in a different framework so that, you know, that there's a notion that if it isn't good, it's demonic. Right. So there, there is that belief structure out there for many. It's a framework by which, you know, we make sense and meaning of the world, but it's also very limited. Uh, and it's, you know, and, it, and it, even as a minister, I say it's questionable at best as well. Right. So, so these individuals just sort of needed some counseling in terms of like, how do I deal with this? Right? When other people are saying I'm, I'm possessed and, other, and, and I think I was abducted. I mean, two very interesting topics rolled into one. How do you approach it with the, I guess, the skill set that you have? If someone came to you and was claiming to be an abductee, what is your your process from there? One as a, I guess, as a as a, uh, as a psychologist, and two as a move on field investigator. And now a quick word from our sponsor. Also, are you wanting more content? Why not become a Believe Plus member? You'll get access to exclusive podcasts and episodes that aren't available to the public. Not only that, you'll also get our regular feed without any ads. Head to believepod.com forward slash plus to sign up today for just $5 a month. Yeah, well, I mean, if somebody approached me and said I had this experience and they wanted to, they wanted me to to investigate it, you know, I'd haul, I'd haul out my my investigators manual and we'd run through the details and get the, you know, get, get the facts as best as they could recall. That's one side of it. If they came to me as a therapist, that's a whole other thing because there's a whole other ethical set of standards that are involved with that. And I wouldn't have, I wouldn't say, okay, that's a very interesting story and haul up my manual. That would be completely inappropriate. So, um, I can honestly say that in, in my, um, in my, um, work as a therapist, I have not yet had an abductee come to me. So it's, it, it was prior to that. Uh, the therapy is a second career for me. Uh, but if I had one, I, w- I would deal with it, you know, much the way probably John Mack had dealt with those is to hear the stories 
and to um, you know as, assess as, as best as one is able. Um, you know, to some degree, the veracity. It, quite frankly, it, my job wouldn't be to to really try to determine the veracity of the story. My concern as a therapist would be: How is this impact uh, impacting you? How is this affecting your daily life? Right? Uh, and to help them help them navigate that. It wouldn't be any different if it was grief or, or stress or anxiety or depression, whatever the case may be. Yes, it's an unusual topic, but it's an event that is impacting them. How are you managing? You know, I've always said, I say to my clients, Dr. Phil may be the one that made the most money off it, but he wasn't the first person to say, and how's that working for you, right? In terms of how are you dealing with this? So that would that would be my emphasis if it was a therapeutic situation. But if it was somebody I met in the pub down here and, and they started telling me a story, you know, yes, you know, that side of me would kick in and, and you know, how are you doing with this? And provided they were fine, then I would certainly be going for the details and trying to 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 um, uh, ascertain the facts of the case. Yeah, it's it's just rather fascinating because it's uh, you know it shows a, a lot of integrity, obviously, on your behalf to to kind of be able to I guess switch off that that response uh, going into those those situations because I could imagine that uh, the people who would reach out to to move on are either kind of desperate they they're potentially at their their last straw and going this is the the last thing we can try to talk to someone or you know find a resolution to whatever happened to us yeah now i i haven't been involved with mufon for some time now but i still like i said i still have the the uh, the manual um and i still keep my ear open for any kind of cases when i um when i switch provinces um i my focus actually then turned into hauntings uh, and those sorts of encounters. Um, so out west, it was very much, very much about UFOs, UAPs, abductees, and back east, it is much more around um, um, ghostly apparitions and, and haunted homes and these sorts of things. So it's it's an interesting to. It's not that there aren't UFO uh, Shag Harbor. I don't know if you've ever heard of the Shag Harbor incident. It is. Um, I suggest people look it up because it's. It may be the. It's either the first or the only documented UFO um, crash USO um, incident that happened in Nova Scotia for which there is a, a Royal Canadian RCMP uh, police report. The RCMP investigated this. Oh, really? And every year now. Yeah, and it's south of Liverpool in Nova Scotia, Shake Harbor between Liverpool and Yarmouth, uh, right on the coast, south, the southwest coast, uh, southeast coast. And... Um, they have a um, Shag Harbor uh, UFO conference every year. Uh, I think they're meeting in the Army this year, if I'm not mistaken. So yeah, it's it, the craft came down. It hit the water. There was green foam. A couple of people went out in dories. They they could see lights moving around. Um, I I, uh, I believe they they thought there was uh, like a I believe there may be believed to have been a second ship. I'm not quite sure, but belief the belief is that there were repairs were being done. Boats went out, and then the thing shot off through the mouth of the harbor. So, um, it is um, it's it's very much a case that that I think a lot of people who are interested in the subject should really read up on. And there is a book written about it, the Shag Harbor S H A G, a harbor incident. Yeah, I'm going to look into that. the 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 name sounds very very familiar to me. Um, I'm definitely going to dive in on that because I am a bit of a sucker for kind of just really obscure ufo uh incidents that don't make a huge amount of like noise or a huge amount of news and i i I think the the world is absolutely full of them um there's there's one that kind of happened in my part of the world about two hours essentially down the road and it was called the um the the tully saucer nest and uh for forever i've always just wanted to go down there and and kind of pick everyone's brains uh, about it, right. so I might have to uh, after we finish up tonight. I might have to pick your brain about how do I best do that. Yeah, yeah. road trip. There you go. Yeah, the craziness of your your life, and and I kind of mean that in the the best way possible. <laughs> 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 Doesn't end there because um, 
we we do have a bit of time to kind of quickly dive into this paranormal aspect of your life because uh, not only have you done uh, MUFON field investigations, you've also done investigations uh, with um, hauntings and, and paranormal um, research teams and things like that. And uh, one of the, the things that I really like about, I guess, paranormal research is EVPs. And uh, you've you've kind of said in your email here that you've actually recorded a fair few of those. So I always find EVPs to be one of these intriguing elements because there's so many different ways to go about getting an EVP. Is there, is there any kind of way that you prefer to do it? And uh, if so, why? The, the, the way that, that, um, we had a group called uh, Dimensions of the North Atlantic um, some years back, and we would sit down and we would set up protocols because you know you see a lot of these paranormal shows and they're running around and you know let the mayhem ensue, and we wanted to be a little bit more reasonable in our approach and wanted to be able to you know look at what we were doing with the kind of scrutiny that other people would look at us. So one of the protocols that we use for uh, EVP was that we would use both digital and analog recording. So for a lot of people, they was, oh, you know, your digital recorder suddenly turned into a receiver and it's picking up, you know, CB broadcasts or taxis or whatever the case may be. And I don't even know how that can happen. But, uh, you know, there, there's, there's a lot of um, uh, rationalization going on in terms of why there may be these unknown voices or sounds appearing on your recording. So the nice thing about doubling up that way is you know you put the two side by side and you hit play and you play it back and if you hear it on both you know that increases the likelihood of the veracity once again that what you've got is something that can only be described as an evp right um and we would you know we would um in terms of how we would question and answer making sure we always knew we always had a radio so we always knew where everybody was in a room or in a field or some such thing to make sure that it wasn't somebody else speaking and then echoing through the building. So we, we always try to make sure that it was isolated and as best as we were able to get two recordings of the event. It's a really interesting way to do that. I, and, and I really like that because digital recording and, and analog recording, they're, they're so similar, but they're also two completely different mm. beasts. Very much. Yeah. I'll tell you what's interesting. Like my partner, she has <laughs> she has zero interest in any of this stuff. Um, she, I think she just amuses me by letting me talk about it somewhat. So I try not to, to bore her to death with it. But I have played her EVPs. Ones that are, and, 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 I, and I actually like that she does this because it really highlights it's a really important point. I will play her EVPs. I'll put them on headphones. I'll put them on speakers. I'll play them loud. I'll play them soft. And she has yet to hear one that says, oh, that says this, this, this. And I'm like, what are you talking about? And, and she, will, she will challenge me and say, okay, wait a minute. So when you guys heard this, did one person say, I hear that, and then everybody else agree? Or did you all hear it separately and write it down? So even she was, you know, so here's something... Uh, I wish she was around some years ago where we were doing this more. Um, here's a here's another thing you can do in terms of protocol. If you get an EVP, play it for yourself. Write down what you think it is. Pass it on to your team member. Let them listen to it. Let them write it down. Because as soon as I say, hey, this sounds like can't help you, which is a famous one that we had once uh, outside of church. We said, we're going inside now. If there's anything else you'd like to tell us, please let us know. And you can hear this very breathy, can't help you. Sounds just like that. She can't hear that. So, you know, it, to, to make sure that you don't uh, taint the water, you know, taint the well, I would suggest that anybody that's, when they're reviewing their, their audio, that if you have a team, uh, each of you listen to it separately, write down timestamp or write down what you think you heard, and then compare notes. And that way, again, if, if you're all hearing the same thing, you're hearing the same thing. If you're hearing different things, then it's a little bit of a word salad, right? And so you you want to put that in the category of a maybe as opposed to a definite. And there's one one of our team members, uh, Mick, he's from the UK, 
um, he would get, and he, he's half Spanish, half British, and sometimes he would get Spanish on his on his recording. <laughs> it's like like they're talking specifically to him and not on mine. It's very unusual. But we got we got one, and I played it for my partner. And she can't hear it. I'm like, how can I hear this? And it was very clearly in a very distinct British accent, very nasally. It was creepy bastards, <laughs> and that that's that's like everybody hears it. My person can't hear it, and I, I don't know why. So um, maybe what I'll do is I'll fire over the the uh, uh, the uh, MP3 later, so you can listen to it yourself. <laughs> but now that I've told you what it is, right? <laughs> I've go, been oh, yeah, tainted, know, right? So you've already been tainted. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's it's really fascinating. I um I, I feel like EVPs are one of the 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 coolest forms of of evidence when it comes to the paranormal because you know getting getting anything on film is is really rare and um it's yeah. it's always so open to I guess being just the the skepticism um. Sure. Being, being faked and, and things like that um, but what I like about EVPs is as it it's almost open to interpretation um, it's, it's kind of like those those 3D puzzles where you can kind of see what you want to see oh I hate those yeah yeah, yeah I, I could never do them <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't do them <laughs> but EVPs is, uh, is kind of like the, the same thing and um, there, there was something that I kind of learned about the paranormal a little while ago is that it's been suggested that the that the paranormal can almost speak to you differently than than anyone else just depending on how in tune with it you are and i think evps are probably a really good example of that type of phenomena being the way that it bees well i i that um that church i told you about where we had can't help you we were camping nearby and in the morning a couple of team members were still in their tent um uh, my friend Brad was was about eight feet away, and, and in between us uh, were his parents, and they were sitting around the fire, and we were each, you know, we we're all shivering there, having our morning hot chocolate. And I heard in my ear, as clear as I'm speaking to you now, I heard Martin, and I looked at Brad, and Brad looked at me, and I said to him, "What did you hear?" And he said, "I just heard your name." And I said, "I heard it too. This is not recorded." And we looked at his parents and said, "Did you hear anything?" Like, no. Nope. But Brad and I both heard my name like whispered in each other's ears. And that same voice, um, we investigated a, a, a case where a, a, a gentleman called us. He was senior himself and his, his mother was quite old. And she had told the story of being touched throughout her life by some spirit. So she was terrified. And it hadn't, hadn't been decades and now it was starting again. And she was probably in her 90s, I think. So this was really upsetting her. So we went over to investigate. We spent the night in the house, the, the whole shtick. And um, and on one of the audio recordings, EVPs, you can hear Martin. And then you get, there's, and then click, click, click. So clicks appear often in, in my EVPs as well. And, and I know other people have heard these click, click, clicks. I don't know what that is. But to me, that was the same voice. That's in two different provinces. Yeah. Wow. Right? That's, that's creepy. Yeah. It is, yeah, I don't, yeah. What's going on there, yeah. mate? You you might have a a little tag along, which uh, you know it's not really uncommon uh, when it when it comes to the the world of the paranormal. People feel like they they bring things home with them, uh, sure, all the time. But who, who knows? Yeah. You you might have a, a bit of a guardian with you. Might be. I mean, I would encourage people to read the uh, the book. Um, uh, skinwalkers in the Pentagon, because it tells the story of A-stop and A-tip, but it's more than just that, um, you know, Lou Elizondo and, and Senator Harry Reid. Um, it actually, I was shocked to find in that book uh, the number of people that had these hitchhikers uh, yeah. come back with them who had visited Skinwalker and like, like terrifying stuff. You know, wolf men, and their, their kids seeing them, like it's crazy. I read this, I go, what is going on here? Like, I was shocked to I was expecting more of just a recount of what went on at the Pentagon, but uh, no, it's it's what happened to these individuals that were involved with this. I mean, it's fascinating. Yeah, and I, I am about four fifths of the way through of um, 
the the original Skinwalker Ranch book, and uh, yeah, the, the the Hitchhiker effect in there is is rather evident as well. And it's um, it you know, it's it's a pretty scary thing to to imagine that these yeah, terrifying we, we've talked things about are following it. you. Yeah, we we've there's been a number of instances where we've done investigations and we've come out of there and you know we've got in the car and we've semi joked about it, but. You know, I think we've all gone home. We've driven quietly for a while, and I think we're all thinking the same thing. Like, damn, I hope when I get home, this, you know, nothing happens. Because it does for some people. I mean, it's... It, um, and it's not a case... And the accounts of the hitchhiker scenario are not suddenly, oh, I heard a noise. Yeah, it's your, it's your furnace cutting in and the, and the pipes creaking. Uh, I remember once in the theology school that I attended for three years, the um, the piano downstairs by the cafeteria occasionally would, pe- would play notes. And you could sit there late at night and you could hear ting, 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 and we're like, what's going on? So, actually, now that might have been one of my first investigations, now that I think about it. Um, and I discovered that there's hot water pipes running behind the wall. So, when the furnace, when the furnace would kick in, they, it would heat up and it would cause certain uh, strings to contract on the piano. So, that's what that was right yeah and you know what the i think there's a lot of uh boring explanations to to a lot of paranormal encounters out there yeah and uh that's that's just the the reality of it all it's um Uh, it's it's the nature of the beast so to say well i had a woman that was taking photographs of her grandmother's face on her door frames in the house it was an old house and so it might have been oak and it was stained and a nice nice uh semi-gloss um a very thing on it and i thought really so i spent about an hour one night with a digital camera just taking photographs flash on flash off different angles and to about 90 percent the same i managed to replicate it and it was like looking at you know faces in the clouds um it was some angles with some light reflection mm. you think you could see it and of course she would interpret that as being a grandmother and that was one of those instances we'd been to that house several times and it's not that there were certainly some strange things happening in the home, but at one point, and it was like the EV, at, at one point, our uh, EMF detector was just going nuts and up against a wall. And I thought it was an interior wall, so I asked somebody to go, I said, just, is that an interior or an exterior? No, it's an exterior wall. It was on the second floor. And I asked somebody to go outside and just take a look at the house, and he came back, and the house was below the, the street level, and that's where the uh, electricity, that's where the meter was connected. Yeah. Yeah. Right? You know, so prosaic. But what I actually did was I asked everybody else to, in the room to leave. There was about six of us in there. And I sat with the person, that uh, the homeowner. And I was, I attempted to do a bit of grief counseling because I summed up a lot of what was happening to their unwillingness to let that person go. And so they were ascribing a lot of meaning to things that were happening to the house as hauntings. Now, there were some things that we could not account for. Um, one of the beauties of that particular setting is they allowed us to go downstairs and shut off the main power to the house. So if you're working with EVP, uh, with EMF detectors and you have power running, like there's always the possibility of, of interference that way. So if we got the homeowner's permission, we'd shut the power off. So zilch, there's nothing in the home. And then if you start getting EV, uh, EMF readings, then you have to wonder, what's that, right? Yeah. Yeah, definitely, definitely. It's um, it's some um, very, very interesting stuff. And uh, in this modern day and age, I feel like ghost hunting with electronic equipment is just potentially fraught with so many, I guess, things to to almost yeah. contaminate the data with Wi Fi, yep. with uh, cell towers, with absolutely everything kind of going around the the wireless route these days. It's um. It's. It really wouldn't surprise me if people feel like things are more haunted these days. When really, it's just their phones pumping out incredible amounts of signals. Be that radio, be that antenna, be that Bluetooth. <laughs> There's just so much coming out of everyone's pockets, basically everywhere they go. Yeah, and there's so much coming out of the internet. So there's so many sites you can go to to see people having out of homes and experiences, and and that feeds into you can't help it. It's just a, it's it's just human nature. It's 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 no insult to anybody's character or integrity, 
But once you have some, they, once you're exposed to something, you be, you can become aware of it and a hyper aware of it, a hyper sense of certain things. And the brain is a meaning making machine. So then we'll try and attribute meaning to something that we can't understand. I mean, there's stuff happens in the house and else. It's a poltergeist. Like I had, I had some serious poltergeist activity when I was when I was a child, and and now when my car keys goes missing, my partner's just shaking their hands and you'll just look at your pockets, like you know. So I'll <laughs> I'll find them in my coat. Oh yeah, I forgot that I wore that <laughs> yesterday. You know. <laughs> so I I have to cash myself because it's like it's not always a poltergeist. So it's um, it's easy to to jump to those kind of conclusions sometimes. I don't know if you remember. Um, the rod uh, years ago there was the whole thing about rods oh like dowsing rods, rods? Were, the, the what the dowsing rods uh, no 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 these were supposedly creatures that lived in the atmosphere and oh, yes. there was the, yes yeah there was a the guy that made a great deal of fodder out of it they said it'd go 30 miles an hour and all this stuff and people and and it's, it came up the other day. I was listening to something. They were talking about rods, like it's like it's a uh, accepted fact. And I thought, oh my god, because I remember being in a house using a night vision um, Sony video camera, and I'm looking at the screen, and it's like, oh my gosh, I got a rod here. And at the time, I was kind of suspecting these things were weren't real anyway. But I got, I'm looking at, I'm following it on the screen of my camera, and then it lands at the top of the stairs. It's a derelict home. It lands, and it's a mom. Because if you, you know, take the time to learn about frame rates, right, on cameras, and then as soon as you go night vision, the frame rate slowed down so everything gets elongated, and it's a mod. Yeah. So, you know, I, I rods rods were written off for me a long time ago. Yeah, you and me both, mate. You and me both. <laughs> but I tell you what, it has been an absolute treat chatting to you tonight there, Martin. Uh, super, super knowledgeable and... Uh, just some really unique perspectives on on everything which i think is always you know important to bring to the conversation when you when you're talking about ufo's when you're talking about the paranormal because it's so easy for for people to kind of get stuck in their box and just have that one one viewpoint so i i really enjoy getting people like yourself onto the podcast and you know just kind of expanding that view in in a, in a really nice gentle way Sure. No, thanks very much. And if I could just put one plug in, I would really encourage everybody to read the book American Cosmic by D.W. Pasalka, American Cosmic. And it is about, um, it. she goes through experiences of, of people with the UFO uh, community and the like uh, in Silicon Valley and how it is that our beliefs form and our beliefs shape us and our beliefs change and stuff. So it's a, I think it's a primer for anybody that wants to get involved or is interested in anything to do with paranormal and the supernatural. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Believe Paranormal in UFO podcast. If you have had an encounter and you would like to share it, please get in touch with me. My email address is believepod at gmail.com. Finally, don't forget to follow us on all our social media outlets and be sure to join our Discord server to talk to other listeners of the show. You'll find all these links in our show notes. Thank you.